In part one of this video, we're going to look at how we can fit three different types of distribution to the incubation times from one of the studies displayed on the, in the introductory video. The data for this video can be found at the URL at the bottom of the slide. Excuse that slide switch, that annoying pesky slide switch. And so I encourage you to take a moment, pause. You can download that data for yourself and play around with it. Also, I will be posting some R code to go along with these slides on Canvas that you can, that you can use to follow along with as well. So the three distributions we're going to be fitting to this data set are a gamma, a Weibull, and a log normal distribution. So before we do that, I wanted to take a minute to review what we mean by maximum likelihood estimation. So maximum likelihood estimation arises in situations when you have a random sample, so in our case y1 through yn is a random sample, chosen from some PDF f of y with an unknown parameter or perhaps vector of parameters theta. Now, the idea behind maximum likelihood estimation is, well, since a random sample is a set of IID draws from this distribution f, then the likelihood function is essentially, you could think of it almost like the probability of getting the specific sample. Although, of course, if it's a continuous distribution, we, we don't want to interpret it that way. But it's essentially the product of the PDFs evaluated at the sample draws yi. Okay. And we want to think of it as a function of theta because our interest is in optimizing this with respect to theta. And if we can do so, then the value of theta, so the arg max, meaning the value of theta which maximizes L of theta, is what we call the MLE for theta. Right. Now, we've done the MLEs for the gamma and the Weibull distribution, so I'll kind of be going over those quickly in review. But we have not looked at the log normal distribution yet in this class, and so I wanted to take a moment to review where that distribution comes from and also how you go about deriving MLEs for its, for its two parameters. So if x is a normal mu sigma random variable, then the random variable y, which is e to the x, is called a log normal random variable. And the reason for the name log normal is, of course, because if I take log of y based on the given definition, okay, we're here, remember we're using this r notation throughout this class that log is, is natural log, right? Log y is going to be x, and x itself is normal, and therefore log of y is a normal random variable, hence this clever name log normal. Now, using what you learned in the last assignment, I encourage you to pause for a moment and just convince yourself that you know how to get the PDF of Y, and furthermore, that it can be written out as something somewhat similar. It looks, looks fairly similar, you'll notice, to the normal PDF function, except that instead of Y, we have log Y up here, and then we also have this factor uh, one over Y that multiplies the PDF, and that, that comes from kind of like the one-dimensional Jacobian, so to speak, of this transformation. So just to give you an example of what these PDFs look like for different values of mu and sigma, the black curve here is what happens if mu is 0 and sigma is 1. So basically, we're taking a transform of a standard normal random variable. Whereas if you increase mu but leave sigma at 1, so that goes to the orange curve, you'll notice we see that the curve gets flattened. So speaking of flattening the curve here, that's exactly what's happening in this situation. And then we also have the situation where I leave mu at 0 and increase sigma. And you can see what that does is sort of squish the distribution in towards 0, gives it a peak closer to 0 there, uh, and, uh, but with still a long tail on the right end. So the, the important thing to note here is that all three of these examples are extremely right-skewed distributions, which makes them sort of a natural thing to try in fitting right-skewed data. Now. To find the MLEs from mu and sigma, it's sort of just an uh, uh, exercise in you know, doing some algebraic shit, as I like to say. So we'll start off noting what the PDF is, and then we'll just write out the likelihood function. And I encourage you as we go through this slide to pause as you need to and work out some of the simplifications for yourself, because I'm going to be ignoring some steps. So the first thing to notice here is that when we're taking a product of n of these, we are going to get a factor 2 pi to the negative n over 2 out front. We're going to get a sigma to the negative n and a y i, excuse me, a product of y i's to the negative n. And that is just from looking at the first term in the expression. 
And then when we take the product of the exponentials, well, we can bring that up, that product into the exponent as a sum, and I'll get log of yi minus mu squared. So to optimize this, we're going to, of course, look at little l, the log likelihood. And some of these terms, when I take little l, I'm going to be able to ignore because they don't depend on either parameter mu or sigma. So for example, this is just going to be, you could think of this as a constant. This one's just a constant. Right? So the two important terms here are the minus n log sigma and the 1 over 2 sigma squared times the sum of the log yi minus mu squared. And so we'll just say plus some constant c here. Then when I differentiate this expression, uh, excuse me for a moment there, that was a little wild, it happens with PowerPoint from time to time, uh, I would need to take dl d theta, which in our case is a two-dimensional vector of mu and sigma, so dl d mu. Right? And the first term in L of theta doesn't depend on mu, the second does. When I differentiate that using the product rule, I'm going to get a 1 over sigma squared times a sum of log yi minus mu. And then setting that equal to 0 implies that the MLE for mu is going to be 1 over n times the sum of the log yi's where that sum, of course, is ranging over all data points. Right? And this is actually very similar to what happens when you look at the MLE for the normal distribution, except that in this situation, I'm replacing the yi's with the log yi's. And for this reason, this parameter mu is often called the mean log, because right? that's essentially what it is doing in this scenario. So then moving on to the MLE for sigma, when you differentiate with respect to sigma, you're going to get negative n over sigma from the first term, and then a plus 1 over sigma cubed times the sum of the log yi minus mu squared from the second term. And then if you set that equal to 0, uh, multiply both sides by sigma cubed, do some algebra shit again, we get a estimate of uh, sigma hat, which is 1 over n times the sum of the log yi minus mu squared. And since we, of course, don't know mu, we substitute in the MLE. Right? Uh, that will make both of these derivatives equal to 0. And so that resulting expression then is the MLE for sigma hat. And we often refer to uh, sigma, by the way, as the SD log. Once we have those MLE formulas, it's pretty easy to calculate them in R with two lines of code. The first one calculates mean log as just the mean of the log incubation time, simple enough, right? And then the second one looks at the mean of the squared deviations, right? This is the squared deviations right here of the incubation times from their mean. And then, of course, take square root because we're interested in the standard deviation there. And these are those two values that you end up getting for, for what it's worth. Well, you might be asking yourself at this point, what is it worth? Well, we can actually use this information along with properties of the log normal to estimate the average time that, that the coronavirus will be incubating in someone who's exposed to it. Now, we could do this directly, right? We could calculate the expected value or median or whatever other measure of central tendency we want to use by using the PDF for the log normal. But it's easier to use the definition of the log normal as an e to the normal random variable. So recall that the moment generating function for a normal random variable is given by this formula, e to the sigma squared t squared over 2 plus mu t. If we use this formula and we plug in t equals 1, right? there's one of those random fun PowerPoint lines there, then notice that the result we get, mx of 1, is going to be e to the sigma squared over 2 plus mu. But recall also that the definition of a moment generating function is as the expected value of x t 
times x. So by plugging in 1, we are literally getting the expected value of e to the x, which is the expected value of our log normal random variable. Wow, what a cool trick. And in fact, that same trick could be used to get any other moments of the log normal as well. And that will be a quiz problem for you later. Now, a second thing that we can easily get is the median for a log normal. So the median, we'll recall, is defined as the value of y, so that probability of y being less than or equal to y is 0 0.5. Well, again, using the definition of y as e to the x, this means that the probability that y, excuse me, e to the x being less than or equal to y has to be 0 0.5 which is the same thing as the probability of x being less than or equal to log y being 0 0.5. So we know from the normal distribution and its symmetries, let me draw a quick picture here. This is the only time in history where I've seen so many of these normal curves drawn on the news of late with all the flatten the curve graphics. So we know for a normal distribution that the mean is its center and also its median, right? So the value of log y, which is going to give you a 0 0.5 probability here, is mu, which implies that y, which is the median we're after, is just e to the mu. So this is a really nice formula for the log normal distribution. That's median is e to the, the, the mean, the log mean, right? So the values you get for those from R, these are much more interesting to get off. The estimated median ends up being about 4.2 days, and the estimated mean is slightly larger, 4.7 days about. And that's, of course, because of the right skewness. For right skew distributions, the mean is usually larger than the median. OK, so how does that compare with what we get for the gamma distribution in the Weibull? Well, I'm not going to go through all the explicit details of these, but I did want to recall a couple quick fa facts about the gamma. You'll recall that if x1 through xr are exponential with parameter theta, then the sum of the xi is a gamma random variable with, with parameters r and theta. And we call r, in this case, the shape parameter. And we call theta the scale. So using this fact, along with moment generating functions, if you like, or convolutions, if you like, you can derive a formula for the PDF in the situation where r is an integer. And then you can extend that to the case where r is not an integer using the gamma function. And we've gone over this and seen this formula many times, so we won't dwell on it too long. But I will remind you that there was no explicit formulas for MLEs available in this scenario. So what we had to do was we had to use a root solver to find them. The code for finding the MLEs of r and theta then are included in that supplementary file. And they're similar to something we did before, but I wanted to just kind of go through the lines and explain what they're doing again. So the first two lines are simply defining the length, so the number of incubation times in our data set and the sum of all those incubation times. The DLDR function is looking at if you go back and you differentiate the gamma PDF, the, gamma, the likelihood with respect to R, this is the function you should get. And this line right here where we're plotting that, this is simply, the purpose of this is to figure out, to hone in on where that root is so that when we call uniroot in R, recall that uniroot requires you give it some starting interval or interval values to look for that root. Uh, so we know we know kind of what to plug in here. Once we have the MLE for R, we can get the MLE for theta. And that just comes out of looking at DLD theta and the formula that arises there. And from there, we can use the resulting gamma distribution to get the median and the mean of the incubation times. So let's see what that output looks like. The first graph, the curve here, just shows that the zero is indeed between four and six, right? We can see the 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 graph here crosses the uh, x the y equals zero axis, and then the estimated median and the mean times end up being very close to what we saw for the log normal distribution before us. Finally, to conclude, we also wanted to compute the MLEs for the Weibull distribution. And since doing so was a previous homework exercise, I'm going to skip that for now and just show you the answers that the median and the mean once again come out to be fairly close to what we saw in the other two distributions. The median is slightly higher and the mean is, is very close. To conclude then this part one video, 
wanted to sh come back to the graph we saw on the title slide. Now we know where these three curves are coming from. And if we look at this graph, all three of them sort of pass the smell test, right? None of them look terrible. You'll notice that the log normal and the gamma sort of tend to try and capture this early peak in incubation times, while the y bowl sort of tries to average out these middle two. And that might be why the median value for the y bowl is slightly higher. So in the next video, what we're going to do is start discussing goodness of fit tests, which are measures of how we can know when we have three different curves like this that all look like pretty good fits, how we could sort of distinguish between them a little bit further.